So now that we've talked about the basics, sort of the bird's eye view of transformative learning, what we really need to do is go back in time to all of the adult learning theory that led up to transformative learning. There is really no way that you can understand this theory unless you look at the influences of people on Mesereau like uh, John Dewey, Paulo Freire, Jürgen Habermas, and all the work that has come after Mesereau, like that of Stephen Brookfield uh, and Victoria Marzik and Watkins. So what we're going to do now is we're going to actually backtrack a little bit and get into uh, this thing called learning itself. So we start with the influence of John Dewey. So here you are again. Let's just begin with you. And that's you, a picture of you sort of pondering the world. Okay. John Dewey says that what we actually do when we talk about a real form of learning is really a ref sort of a reflective practice. Just sort of what he might call a careful, intentional, and considerate reflection on reality at all times so that we don't really take things for granted. And he called this a genuine education. That's the heart of the theory that we're talking about here, is a genuine education. This is different than what we might call, uh, or Paulo Freire would call, the banking methodology of education, uh, which is really more informative. This is sort of like dumping uh, information into your head, uh, like you do when you're a child. You learn about mathematics and social studies and so forth. But learning in adulthood is a more genuine form of learning, is learning through experience. And do we use something called continuity principle to describe this? And that is that when we go through life, as we talked about in previous videos, we've got experience, but there's the continuous transformation of experience. He calls this continuity principle. So it's not like we step outside of experience, we think about our experience and go back into it. Although that does happen sometimes with some adult learning uh, methodologies such as after action reviews or just simply taking time to reflect on what happened. But more often we don't really have so much time to do that in the day. So uh, we're sort of in this continuous flow, this continuous loop of having the experience, reflecting on it, acting on it, and then revising our assumptions ever so slightly and so on and so forth with e which e with each additional experience. So Donald Schoen sort of takes this to the next level when he talks about two sort of ways of reflecting in time. So Donald Schoen talks about reflection on action. and reflection in action. So in the case of transformative learning theory, we think about being met with a disorienting dilemma. And when that happens, we don't always have the luxury of being able to say, time out, and walking away and thinking about it. So most transformation actually occurs over longer periods of time, which, which Meserol talks about as incremental uh, transformative learning. It's not always as romantic as it looks in the movies, which Mesereau would call epical. This is sort of like, boom, transformation. I'm a whole new person. Sometimes it takes a while for the transformation to take grip in your life. So there's two ways that you can reflect. And depending on uh, these relationships between reflection and time, you're reflecting on different things. So when you're reflecting on action, you actually have a language. You put a language around what happened. You talk about it. You create a story. And when you weave that story, you're doing it through the lens of your assumptions. It's nice to have that time to do that. But there's also reflection in action. And this is something that's inordinately important because being able to act on the fly has become more and more important these days, especially when we look at organizational change, 
emergent leadership, and conflict. The, the ability to course correct. Now, when you're reflecting in action and you're actually in the moment, there is no real language about it. Instead, you're working with symbols and intuition and deeper things that you might say that language is the wrapper around. So this is sort of like the guts of experience. And reflecting on action is fundamentally different from reflecting in action. So besides uh, Dewey and Schoen, we also have David Kolb. And David Kolb talks about, he sort of blows up this idea of continuity principle, right? And he talks about four different ways that we go about transforming our experience into an understanding of the world. And he, he mentions that people tend to have preferences. So one preference, my shorthand here, is to have concrete experience. So think about if you get a new cell phone and you want to learn about the new cell phone, just picking it up and dialing the number and sort of doing what you always did and allowing the experience of the cell phone to sort of wash over you and through that process simply learning. These are the people who just dive into it. And if you're one of those people, this is most likely your preference. The next preference is remote observation. Now, these might be the type of people, reminds me of my, my dad, who would like to look over the shoulder, my shoulder in this case, at how I use the cell phone and then sort of look at that, pull it into perspective, and then try it out himself. So these are people who take more of a uh, removed uh, process of learning. But it's still, there's still a moment where they integrate it. And then you have something called abstract conceptualization. And this is simply looking at the phone and thinking, what, what are all the things that I might do with this phone? And planning in your head all of the great ways that you can use the phone, and maybe even thinking about how one operation in the phone connects with another, and you might connect those operations together to operate the phone. Um, and so if you're that type of person, you're probably a preference of abstract conceptualization. And the last one, last but not least, is active experimentation. And according to David Kolb, this is a little bit different than concrete experience because what it entails is thinking about what you're going to do and then testing it out, actively experimenting in the world. So if you think about any sort of learning that you've gone through, for instance, if you're learning how to play baseball or learning how to give good feedback to an employee, you could think about the way that each of these learning styles impacts uh, the preference. Also, the preference that you have tends to be the way that you teach others because you privilege that way of learning. And these are really important uh, things to understand. So now we've got John Dewey, uh, Schoen, Kolb, and I couldn't do this discussion without mentioning that when we think about adult learning, or learning in general, we think about the four walls of education. You come into a place, you get a, a little lecture like this, uh, you get a grade. Now, adult learning doesn't really happen that way because we're, we're in the midst of life, right? So Karen uh, Watkins and Victoria Marzik, Marzik and Watkins, talk about something called informal or incidental learning. versus formal learning. And they have a lot of information out there on that. But thinking about informal or incidental learning is thinking about learning that happens during the day, right? So a lot of learning is not explicit. It's more tacit. We just sort of like learn by doing, learn by interacting. There's learning by the water cooler, what's going on. There's learning by observing your mentor that is less formal in nature. And a lot of times, the less formal it is, the more powerful it becomes, and the more part of you that becomes. 